Good morning, everybody. Um, I love Fridays. Do you know why I love Fridays? Because actually, I can travel to work about 10 minutes quicker on a Friday. And it's so quiet in my office on a Friday. Why? Because I've let everybody work flexibly. I have 10 people in my team. There's only three of us that work, what I would call a traditional type of Monday to Friday um, on a full-time hours basis. Now, from a client perspective, actually, most of the clients don't know that. And if anybody's sitting in this room that um, does use us, um, don't be horrified by that because we ensure that if we're letting people work flexibly, it's actually a two-way street. And that's the most important thing, um, I think, for um, us all to remember, that flexible working, it's not just about the employee and their entitlement to do something. They've got obligations to the employers. And it's really hard, I think, to make flexible working work properly and work, as Maureen can say, it's that smart working, but that smart working takes an awful lot of effort on both sides. Um, so I love Fridays because my dream of a four-day week never materialised, but I at least get ten minutes onto my day now on Friday, so maybe that's what I've got to put up with. Um, flexible working, I think employers fall into probably four categories here. You've got the category of employer that doesn't need any regulation. They just get it. They know it works for their business, and they've been doing it intuitively for years. So those are the progressive employers that really don't need the regulations. There are then those employers who feel compelled to do something because a set of regulations prior to 1st of July this year, a very prescriptive set of regulations um, were put in place, which meant that you had to follow some you know, quite onerous statutory timetables. And those employers feeling compelled to do something are probably not sort of all of the way there. They're not going to culturally embrace flexible working perhaps as they should. There are those employers that simply will not get it and will say no. Um, and I'm not going to stereotype, but I am going to stereotype because I can't do a presentation without putting my view in there. But I think that and actually, Rory, I'm going to, you're, going to, you're going to be cross with me here. But I think very small businesses have huge issues with um, regulations on flexible working. Um, you know, I've got a number of friends, a number of you know, sort of clients that you know it does terrify them. They don't have the resources, um, you know, to be able to sort of flex their. Um, business models, and yes, they know they can say no, but they also know they've got to go through quite a lot of hoops before they can say no, and they also know there's quite a risk if they get things wrong and if they say say the wrong thing. So those employers that simply just say no, it might be because they're ignorances, or it might be because business-wise they, you know, they've got to say no. And then there are those employers that I think fall into the absolute worst category. Those employers that very smugly, oh yes, we're embracing flexible work and we've got this policy, we've got that policy, we've got these guidelines for managers. But actually, when it comes to it, who's actually um, dealing with it? It's the managers who haven't had the training, who culturally are not in a headspace to embrace flexible working. So you can have all the policies in the world, all the guidelines, all the intranet um, flash-ups about flexible working, but actually, if the core of your business is not embracing it, actually, there are better those that just say no from the start. So I think there's four categories. Um, before I properly begin, thank you, Richard, for this yesterday. What a fantastic introduction. Um, <laughs> and I'm sure Eric is thinking, why? Why did he say this? Um, it is limited to 170 of his personal staff, that's what I understand. Oh my goodness, what are the rest of the Virgin business saying? Are they saying, well, why are your 170 personal staff so important? But what a, what a statement. Now, this is the ultimate in flexible working. Um, I've heard since this is put out yesterday, a few other businesses. I've heard actual, you know, sort of um, 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 uh, real life stories of organisations who said, well, we've done this for quite a while, actually, and nobody abuses it, because the people we recruit, <coughs> we recruit them on the basis that they work hard, they're enthusiastic, they're passionate, they use their initiative, 
and they're flexible. So actually, maybe it's down to the recruitment process. You know, you get your recruitment process right, and actually flexible working becomes a doggle because people mm. aren't going to abuse um, perhaps the privileges or the, the grown-up status. Uh, Maureen was talking about adult to adult. You know, and this is probably a classic example of adult to adult. Um, and whilst Maureen was talking about that, I was thinking about when I was um, um, studying for my law degree, we, we had our category of employment law wasn't called employment law, it was called master and servant. Um, you know, and, and then it moved into labour law, which you know, to me was probably a bit more pregnancy related than master and servant. And now, you know, is, you, you study the employment law model. But this is, this is a very adult way, I think, of treating your staff um, to embrace flexibility. But anyway, I'm sure you've read about it. I'm sure there'll be lots more. I'm sure the weekend papers will, will debate it, um, and the pros and the cons of it. Um, I want to talk about two main things. Uh, flexible working, the new regime that we've had since 1st of July. Uh, shared parental leave that really does scare the life out of me as an employer, as an employment law practitioner, I am so glad I'm not in HR because I think that you really are going to have your work cut out with shared parental leave. Um, antenatal appointments and, and reservists and governors, just, just to tell you what's coming up there. But if we look at flexible working first in terms of the regulatory legal framework of, of flexible working. So now we're all aware that anyone, any employee <coughs> in the organisation, can request um, to work flexibly. It's a right to request, it's not a right to work flexibly. And that's the most important thing, I think, to get over to your line managers, that you know, it doesn't mean that because somebody's put this request in, that this is what's definitely going to happen. The ACAS code, um, when it came out to support the regulations, um, the first draft of the code, um, had a um, had a phrase in, which which was subsequently removed, and I think it was you know it was it, it was a good thing it was removed, but it was along the lines of, well unless you've got a really good reason, you're going to have to pretty much grant everything. That was pretty much what it was saying. They realised that was probably a little bit too onerous, too much pressure on employers. So that was removed. But get across to your managers. This is, this is a request process. And there are reasons for refusal, um, which I will come to in a moment. So everybody can apply. Um, um, everybody has the right to request. I don't know what 1st of July was like in your organisations, whether it was a pile of papers like this or whether it was business as usual. I suspect it was business as usual. Um, I know from an advisory perspective in terms of calls and requests for help coming into us, most employers have got their heads around it, and most people knew that um, this was coming in. Most organisations, anyway, had embraced the whole, well, we're not just going to keep it to those people with children or, or those people with caring responsibilities. If somebody else wants to work flexibly, we're actually going to consider that alongside the, um, um, the categories of employees who previously had the um, eligibility to request. Um, and I think that was really important that um, employers did that before the new regulations came in because as Maureen said, you have the element of tension within organisations, within teams, if there are the haves and have-nots, effectively, um, um, who are allowed to work. <coughs> I think this now means that, okay, there are still going to be some inconsistencies, but at least if everybody starts off um, on a level playing field, everybody starts with the right to be able to request, it removes some of the tensions and it removes some of the, you know, just because you've got children or just because, you know, um, you've got a caring responsibility. Um, so, one of the administrative burdens of the flexible working regulations has now been removed in that there is no prescriptive timetable for dealing with the request. So when you get that written request in, you're not having to schedule any meetings within specific mandatory timeframes. You are, however, going to have to deal with it reasonably. And we all know from an employment HR context um, that reasonably means, usually without undue delay. 
So you don't wait until um, you know, sort of one day before the three month period is finished and have your first meeting. Because actually what the regulations have said is you've got three months to deal with the request, which is three months to complete the process. So if you want to do everything in the first couple of weeks, fine. You may not be able to do that because you may need to be gathering some information about the impact that that proposed change working pattern is going to have on the department, both from a, a resource point of view um, and possibly a financial um, point of view as well. Um, so don't think because the prescript, prescriptive timetable has gone, there isn't a timetable. There is. It's a three-month one, but it's up to you um, to work through how you're going to um, fit your various meetings and potential appeals within that three-month um, time period. Now, the right to work flexibly is really the right to ask for three things. The right to ask for a change in hours worked, so the number of hours worked. The right to ask to change the times you work those hours. So you may still want to do 40 hours, but you may want to do them differently. And Maureen, helpfully, in, 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 I think her penultimate slide, put up what the various forms of flexible working could be. So compressed hours, I think, is a really attractive flexible working model if, you, if, if your business can sustain that. Um, it means the employee isn't suffering any financial um, um, reduction. I think it probably means you're going to get, it should mean you're going to get the same output, um, you know, important word, output, um, in terms of performance from the employee. And actually compressing your hours and getting the same output, maybe doing four days instead of doing five days at the same amount of work, that's a great business model. We've just moved offices um, at ASB Law. We haven't reduced staff, but we took office space that was 20% less than where we previously were. Because we suddenly <coughs> said, actually, do you know what? The number of bums on seats at any time has reduced. Why is that? Actually, we've got quite a few people possibly working from home. We've got quite a few people, actually, who have started to do the compressed hours model. Wow, that's a 20% annual rent saving for us. Now, if you need anything to convince your managers or convince your finance directors, you know, and your lease is about to come up for renewal, think about that in terms of trying to convince the business as a whole that flexible working can be really commercially savvy um, as a decision for your business. Um, so hours, times, and then the right to request to work um, at a different place. And we all know that a different place usually means home. I think the home one is the one that actually managers really struggle with. It's the one where I find, if I'm advising clients, the first reaction that comes out is, well, what are they going to be doing at home? Can we insist that they switch the telly off? Can we remove the telly or something? Okay, it's a little bit OTT. But it's no, it's the trust, and it comes back to this adult issue, it comes back to the output and the performance. Because if somebody's working from home, wow, that visibility is, is so powerful within their organisation. You feel much more comfortable if people are visible, if you can see them writing, if you can see them emailing. You don't know what they're emailing, they could be putting XXXXX, but actually, you know, you, will, you feel so much better as a manager if you can see that productivity going on, um, even though it might not be effective productivity. Um, so working from home, I think, is the really difficult one. There are health and safety issues, obviously. There are confidentiality and data protection issues that you need to look at as an organisation. There's the one that everybody hates talking about, but there's the, well, I want to work from home for childcare reasons. Oh, gosh, what? Where have they been? Um, you know, we had a request yesterday from a client, or we had a request for advice from a client, who had received an employee request to work at home for five days a week. Great, okay? So, the reason being, they were still breastfeeding baby. Now, okay, well, we know where baby's going to be. <laughs> if you want to work at home, because, no, no, baby will be born to me um, in three hours. 
um, four feet. Okay, now that's a fairly extreme example, but there are lots of examples of people are asking to work from home. They may not say it's for childcare reasons, and you mustn't assume, but actually you do know, you do have a feel that they are not necessarily going to be 100% committed to their work if they have got a child in the next room. Who is going to ignore a screaming baby? That's the reality of the situation, and then nobody really likes to talk about it, but actually you do need to have that conversation, and you do need to ask your employee if they're in that sort of situation, look, I really do need to know what your arrangements are going to be um, for childcare, because if I'm allowing you to work from home, I need you, you know, to recognise that we, we know that you're actually working from home. And yes, you can measure outputs and you can measure productivity, um, but then there are other issues as well. You know, there's going to be customer-facing, um, you know, telephone calls, etc., from home. You know, you don't want the distractions um, of um, a child um, um, in the background. And before anybody thinks that I'm an old dinosaur, I have two children, I've done it all. <laughs> but, you know, they're, they're old enough now. Um, they shout at me now when I work at home. They go, go back to work, you know, you're disturbing us on our feet or whatever. Um, but, you know, so I, I do talk about it from the perspective of sort of knowing, um, you know, knowing the difficulties. Managers have a habit of receiving a request if it doesn't come directly to HR, and this is perhaps where your policies may be able to help you. you know, perhaps the request should go directly to HR rather than coming into manager direct. Because a manager has, a, uh, has, has perhaps a, um, a natural reaction of, oh, when receiving a request, or you know, their favourite word, the tut. Um, <laughs> you know, how is this going to work? A lot of body language can give off very negative signals when somebody puts a request in and they think from the outset um, that you know, well, we haven't got a hope that our um, um, request is going to get through. So in terms of training your managers on, in terms of things such as flexible working requests, it's really important that they are at the core of, of, of knowing um, what the employee's entitlements are um, and what they need to be doing. And what evidence they need to have really to deal with those requests when they come in. Because a lot of people have a gut feel, a lot of people sort of anecdotally think it's not going to work. Um, a lot of people perhaps have had a bad experience somewhere else, perhaps with another employee who you know, approach it in a completely different way. So, you know, there's a shield that comes down. Um, that shield you need to be in a position to, you know, remove, just put them on a, you know, sort of a, um, a sort of neutral position. Um, when they receive a request. Gathering that information um, about whether it's going to work or not is, is, is critical. I think that's working as a two-way street and it's become more of a two-way street now because the employee has to actually think themselves as well about how it's going to impact um, their work, their colleagues, their departments. And that analysis by the employee in their written application is very important because they might think halfway through their written application, actually, I do realise now this probably isn't going to work because actually I have customers to deal with at this time, or you know, I'm in a transatlantic. This is a transatlantic business, and you know the times I want to work just do not going to fit in with um, you know um, the customers, the clients um, of my organisation. Um, so I think some employees, it's a bit of a therapeutic process going through an application. They may get through it and they may think, actually, do you know what, if I was in boil, I'd probably say no. So I'm not going to put this in at this point. Or I'm not going to put it in as a permanent request. I'm going to put this in and say, look, can we see how this works informally first? Um, and when we're talking about flexible working and the regulations that came in 1st of July, it's really important to remember that that's the formal request. I would have thought that 50% at least of flexible working was probably done on the basis of not any formal request would be put in. Somebody's asked, somebody said, look, I've got a child starting in school and I'm not sure what the school run's going to be like, so could I start from half past nine? Because I think traffic's going to be bad in the end of 25. Can we try that for six months and then just see how it goes? And actually a good organisation is probably going to say, yeah, do you know what, you're a great employee. Um, we don't need to go through a process of you know, formal written requests to deal with that. 
that's what we'll do and let's review it in six months' time. Um, and this is perhaps where things such as trial periods come in. Mm -hmm. Trial periods got a bad press for the old flexible working regulations because there was a couple of cases that went through the tribunals <coughs> where actually, as employers, saying yes but on the basis of trial period isn't granting flexible working. I don't know where those employment judges sat or worked before, and I'm very sorry if any of you are on tribunal panels, but I think that was a ridiculous decision because trial period is probably the only way to work through, is this going to work, both for the employer and for the employee? And the new APS code on this does actually veer towards a much more positive approach to trial periods. Collate much evidence, you know, review after three, six months. You may find the employee comes back to you and says, do you know what, it didn't really work. Can I go back to what I um, was previously doing? And you wouldn't have to necessarily agree to that because a change to the contract after a flexible working request to be put in is a permanent change. Um, but again, it's about treating each other as adults and treating each other as what's going to be most effective for this organisation. Um, so I would say do if you feel something that you're not too sure about if it's going to work and you're not too sure about the impact, actually do have the trial period. Um, dealing with conflicting requests, okay, this could be the big discrimination tool. Um, this is where you have the tensions in an organisation um, or in a department where somebody thinks, do you know what, Helen has been working three, four days a week, Helen's been working flexibly, I really like the idea of that, I'm going to go and request. No, sorry, we can only have one Helen in the department during those hours. It's been tough enough trying to manage Helen's workload. Like, oh my goodness, I'm going to have an hour's break today, but now I've got to manage two of you like that. That creates the tensions. That's why, you know, if you have some sort of guidelines as an organisation, and you do then embrace those guidelines and you share them with employees, they will realise actually there comes a tipping point when there can be only be so many Helens working flexibly, perhaps, within a department and you won't get multiple requests, or at least if you do get the multiple requests, you've already got your reasons why you're potentially going to refuse um, that request. <coughs> However, what trumps a flexible working request? So if I want time off, um, because every Friday afternoon I want to go to Alexander House Hotel and have a massage, as opposed to one of my colleagues who every Friday afternoon needs to take their daughter to learn Mandarin, or another colleague who has to, um, you know, sort of take their uh, mother to the hospital for a regular appointment. What's more important? How are you, as the employer, actually going to, you know, sit in moral judgment as to which one is more important? Um, and it's a real issue, and that's why your reasons for refusal or reasons for accepting requests is incredibly subjective still. Um, it's also the reasons why the tribunals will shy away from actually examining under the flexible working regulations um, forensic reasons as to why you might have refused a request, provided you've got what is um, a credible business reason that falls into one of the eight categories and provided that was based on correct facts and provided they can see some degree of you know, business investigation on the impact, tribunals will leave you alone in terms of flexible working regulations. If you get some of the technicalities wrong, what's going to happen? There's an eight weeks pay award at the 470 maximum weeks pay. So actually that's not too bad. However, we all talk about flexible working and we've all talked about flexible working in, in the context of the regulations. They have no teeth. You know, they are what makes your business work. But from a legal perspective, the big scare with flexible working is all the things you get wrong on the discriminatory side. Um, and that's where people will always take their claims. So we've had the traditional 
you know, um, somebody coming back from maternity leave wants to go from five days to three days and they don't get that and therefore there is an indirect sex discrimination claim that hits the tribunal because the individual is saying, you know, your provision criteria practice of making this job be five days a week isn't something you can justify. So we've had the um, sex discrimination cases that come out of flexible working. We may see um, other discrimination and the protected characteristic cases such as um, um, disability um, discrimination coming out of flexible working is actually somebody may be requested flexible working as part of a reasonable adjustment. So a change to hours, change to place, change to times worked, <coughs> all considered to be reasonable adjustments. And if somebody has um, you know, the eligibility to bring disability claim, um, and the flexible working request has been turned down, they may bring it on a reasonable adjustment um, um, basis as well. But maybe religious discrimination claims. You know, maybe somebody doesn't want to work um, you know, on the Sabbath um, because of um, their religious belief. And they're actually asking for flexible working to change the times of their working due to a religious um, belief. So there are quite a lot of things that potentially um, you know, can, um, can be a minefield that are far more serious in terms of their applications and in terms of tribunal claims than actually just breach of flexible working regulations that came in on the 1st of um, July of this year. Now, moving on to a brand new area that is going to create, I think, a massive cultural shift and confusion and all sorts of things within the workplace is shared parental leave and pay. So you really haven't got long to get houses in order now with regards to this because it's any babies due or children adopted after 5th of April next year. Um, the legislation will come into force in December and therefore you are likely to get in first requests 1st of January. Um, in terms of the um, shared parental leave. The most difficult thing I think that you're going to have to contend with is the fact that those 52 weeks leave that the mother could take, subject to perhaps a father taking some additional paternity leave, which I don't think was really taken up um, very highly at all, um, and that will go anyway now. Um, but the 52 weeks a year, the 39 weeks pay, you knew was going to the mother of the child. Um, you knew that they would just take it, and you know what, oh, gosh, they're off for a year, that's a real hassle, but actually, we'll get somebody in, we'll get somebody in on a fixed time contract to cover that. Life is no longer going to be simple, because the position is that they can now seek mother and father to take that leave and to take that pay on a shared basis, taking that leave in three potential blocks. And they only need to give eight weeks notice of the blocks they want to take. They can put in their request to say, I'll take this block, that block, and another block. But if they want to vary it after they've given the request in, they can do that as well, provided they give eight weeks notice of variation. How on earth are you going to resource that gap when somebody is off anymore? And that is going to be a real headache. We've only had the first set of regulations come through on this. There's another two regulations that are still chomping their way through um, the drafting cycle. Um, so there's still a couple more things that we're, we're, we're waiting to see how it will work through. But this three block is the one where you really need to start looking your policies and procedures um, are very <coughs> You can, as an employer, object to the requested blocks that the employee has said that they want to take. But what you can't do is obviously, you know, object to the amount of time they're entitled to take, but you can object to the blocks on the basis that that doesn't fit with your particular business model. Um, but again, you're going to have to have, you know, good reasons as to why that is. So, um, good luck uh, on this one. Um, 
So I'm glad I'm no longer there from a, from a personal point of view. Although, actually, do you know what? I think this is going to create so much domestic unrest. Can you imagine? There may be people here of childbearing age, I don't know. There may be fathers of childbearing, women age, whatever you want to call them. Uh, but there is so much unrest between mother and father deciding who's going to have what. But you know, I want the summer off. No, 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 I want the summer off. Oh, I want Christmas off. Oh, no, 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 that's, that's the child I'm talking. Um, and whilst it may be horrific for us as employment lawyers to be advising on this, what I have said to our family department is actually, you know what, I'm going to have some, just leave it off. You're going to have some order here. And, um, yes. So maybe it'd be another ground of divorce, you know, with an unreasonable behaviour perhaps. But um, um, and, and what on earth happens if the parties do split up, sort of those blocks, and can't agree between themselves? Sorry. I mean, there are so many questions on this, and I'm happy to take them sort of during the break, so I'm going to run away for a little bit. Um, but it, it's very much, you know, one that I think you're going to have to spend a lot of time this autumn um, getting trips with. Um, I suppose, um, oh, actually, I just want to say something about enhancing um, um, statutory um, paternity pay, so shared paternity pay. Um, quite a lot of employers had enhanced maternity pay. Oh gosh, don't just pay your enhanced maternity pay to the mother. If the father then is going to take time off, you clearly have got a discriminatory issue if you are not going to be giving a comparable enhancement to the father. Some employers spotted this a couple of years ago when they saw this on the horizon and they stopped enhanced pay because they thought this is just going to be unworkable. Again, it's a little bit controversial, but. If the father perhaps is a higher earner, he may choose to take some time off, you know, during a period where he would perhaps only be getting statutory maternity pay, but if it's an enhanced scheme of that organisation, may think, well actually, I'll take that period when I'm still getting the enhanced benefit. So, you know, there is a <coughs> Um, burden potentially on who takes what and at what time. Not that you should necessarily be looking at that and using it as a reason for refusing the blocks that they want to take. But if you sit down as the new mother and father and you work out who's going to take what when, you're going to do that with a calculator next to you as well. Um, so you know, just watch that. Um, okay, um, antenatal appointments, very quickly. Um, again, lots of employers probably let the fathers go to antenatal appointments as well. There is now the new right for the father to go to up to two appointments. Where did antenatal appointments become six and a half hours long? <laughs> um, and that's what she stipulated. <laughs> They're having triplets or what? But um, that's what's been stipulated up to six and a half hours per appointment. I guess that takes into travel time and things for, you know, the coffee after and the lunch and what have you, but um, that is that that is a new right that's now come in. Uh, reservists and governors, um, obviously very popular today, you know, perhaps with, you know, government being, government being called and things, but um, now from 1st of October, um, if 
somebody does suffer um, a detriment because they've not been um, permitted to take their time off um, to undertake their reserved armed forces activities, then they're, they're not brought back perhaps after they've been on a period of duty or they're dismissed because of disruption to the business because of their um, reserved armed forces duties. Um, it's now an automatically unfair dismissal category, so it doesn't need any qualifying service. Um, academy governors, um, again, time off um, for um, public duty, even though um, the academies are you know, sort of moving away from the um, government um, um, sort of um, strings, but there will be um, the ability to take time off for academy governors as there will for um, all governors of um, local authority schools. Um, and I just put those up there because actually people don't go to work, just go to work. That's not their reason for being you know, on this planet anymore. They want to do lots of different things. They might want to be a governor, they might want to be in the armed services, they might actually want two jobs. And I think that's what we're seeing as well now, the growth of you know, employees saying, I don't just need one job, I'd like to do a series of them. Uh, perhaps got four days a week with you, but I've got a zero hours contract with another employer. And actually that might be my reason for asking to work flexibly because they actually want to go and do another job as well. So we've got a whole shift of the way people actually approach work now. And with that, I know I'm a little bit over, so, okay. okay.